Yeah, so my name is Ash. I run a software project called Unum, where we build a low level libraries for large scale data processing. We focus mostly on search like problems. So those are very IO intensive and we build the whole stack from the very bottom level. So if we need to write assembly, we write assembly. And then uh, we oftentimes wrap it into higher level libraries for different programming languages. So in many cases, we're kind of language agnostic and you can use our software from Python, from JavaScript, from Rust, from C++, from Golang, Objective-C, C Sharp, Wolfram, or any other language. Uh, I've been working on this for the last eight years. And uh, today I'm here to talk about like one of the projects that we released this year. Uh, so every talk today was kind of going in the direction of vector search and retrieval augmentation, which is obviously a very important technique uh, in the AI space. And it's based on search, obviously. So we also wanted to participate. We've released our vector search engine, which seems to be uh, one of the most scalable in the industry. So we focus mostly on vertical scalability and being able to process as many uh, points as possible on a single machine. So uh, the search engine is called Usearch. Uh, as mentioned, it's available for all kinds of different programming languages. And it has a couple of really nifty features. Uh, most importantly, like we do not really aim to build up a database per se. We're building an engine that is used by other databases. So let's say this search engine is used within ClickHouse. It's used within multiple Postgres companies including LanternDB, which is like a new Postgres fork with better vector search capabilities. It's also used within mobile apps with millions of installations, but you can also use it in Python. And uh, when you use it in Python, it will allow you to index billions of points, store them on one machine, view them from external memory, also define any arbitrary similarity functions. So you can store not only vectors and compare them with cosine similarity, but also like arbitrary objects and then just define a custom similarity measure for them. Uh, meaning that this is not only a vector search engine, it's a similarity search engine. Uh, building something like this generally requires understanding of like the scaling problems. So if you work with only thousands or oftentimes even like millions of points, there are a lot of other techniques that um, help you get done with your workload faster. So uh, it's quite well known that uh, NumPy, uh, one of the most commonly used data science projects in Python ecosystem, doesn't really implement math itself. It uses a standard called BLAS, basically in your algebra subroutines. And BLAS is like a set of assembly C or CUDA libraries that implements matrix operations. So if you work with, let's say, even tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of vectors, oftentimes it's faster just to compute the dot product of two matrices and get the result. Uh, so like you don't really need vector search engine or database for that. But when you're dealing with hundreds of millions, billions of elements, uh, you need an indexing data structure for that. So I wanna share some of the issues that we faced uh, implementing this vector search engine. And this is uh, 15th vector search engine over my career. Uh, I would generally separate them into four families. Uh, the first family is the most ancient one. It's called space filling curves. Uh, it's uh, the one actually shown on the picture. So a few hundred years ago, uh, Hilbert was working uh, on a math problem where he tried to uh, prove that the number of points on a two-dimensional grid uh, of uh, integers is identical to the number of points or integers on uh, one axis. And he has a beautiful geometric proof for why it is the case. Uh, and later, this approach that he used as a geometric proof was used as a way of indexing two-dimensional planes, three-dimensional point clouds, uh, and uh, gave birth to methods like uh, the Hilbert curve, Piano curve, Z curve, all kinds of those things. And if you were using databases like 20 years ago, you would have seen some of the plugins that utilize those technologies 
to index latitudes, longitudes, or like X, Y, Z points, whatever, three-dimensional coordinates. Uh, the other approach that is quite famous is called KD trees. It's an approach of indexing spaces where you build a high dimensional tree. Oh, sorry, uh, you build a tree uh, that indexes a high dimensional space with different hyperplanes. So like for every set of points, it finds the hyperplane that separates the set of points into two sets of somewhat equal size. And it continues the process recursively until uh, the sets are very, very small or like just one point. The third one that is also quite well known today so like the key dimensional trees were popular um, for um, machine learning about 10 years ago. They were also popular for lower dimensional spaces about 30 years ago in the first uh, game engines. Uh, they were popularized as octa trees and quad trees. Uh, and then the third category is the locality sensitive hashing, uh, which is uh, honestly in many ways closer to like a dimensionality reduction technique than an indexing approach. Uh, the three categories I just mentioned are nice and interesting, but today we're going to talk about HNSW um, and in general proximity graph algorithms. Those are the ones that became popular in the last 10 years. They are most by, used vec by most vector search engines. Uh, they're available in phase, in HNSW lib, in U search. And their idea is that instead of uh, like trying to reduce the number of dimensions or building up a tree, let's build up a graph or essentially a network where we connect neighboring points with each other. And we have a special methodology how we do it so that it works fast and we can traverse only a small part of the graph when we search for nearest neighbors. And later in 2016, this algorithm was improved with a hierarchical approach. So in computer science, whenever we need to solve a problem and we cannot do uh, it the normal way, we add a hierarchy. So like instead of working with a, an array, we work with trees. Instead of working with one graph, let's work with a hierarchy of graphs, each smaller and smaller. So it was popularized in this paper, efficient and robust approximate nearest neighbor search using hierarchical, hierarchical navigable small world graphs from 2016. The idea is quite simple. Uh, so in the bottom layer, we have like uh, a network of uh, points uh, that kind of uh, describes the similarity and the links between vectors that are similar to each other. And we also build up smaller and smaller layers. So like uh, the layer zero will contain all the points, all the vectors in our collection. The layer one will contain a small fraction and the layer two will contain even smaller fraction, ideally just one point. So we start at the top. And then within every layer, we find the part that is the closest. And then as soon as we part, find this part, uh, we kind of dive deeper, exploring the underlying layer. So this is kind of similar to hierarchical clustering approaches, but it's better because in clustering, you kind of isolate clusters from each other. That's the goal. And during traversal or lookup, you oftentimes end up with a boundary condition. So let's say, uh, we somehow found this uh, green point uh, within one of the clusters, and then uh, one of its neighbors may be in a different cluster. So hierarchical clustering approaches would not allow you to kind of find uh, any kind of neighbors within the point cloud E2, even though they might be physically close to the green point. In HNSW and similar proximity graph algorithms, you can kind of jump from one cluster to another during the exploration process. So there are a lot of like technical nuances about the algorithm. So like people call them the small world algorithms. I'm not sure they're strictly small world, uh, but today I wanna talk not about the, the algorithm structure and potential future improvements of the indexing approaches, but instead about the applied side, like how do you use those libraries and what are the bold bottlenecks? Like, why does it make sense to have specialized libraries for this kind of scale? So the three libraries that I'll be discussing and comparing are HNSWLib, which is the original implementation, Metaspace library, which is the most popular, frequently used with probably 1.5 million monthly downloads from PyPy, and our use search as well. So to benchmark, uh, those kinds of algorithms, there are two well-known uh, 
methods or repositories. One of them is called ANN benchmarks, and the other one is big ANN benchmarks. Um, needless to say, big ANN is bigger than the normal one. Uh, neither of them are like really large this year at least. So like big ANN is like an annual competition. Previously, it was like 1 billion points. Now they shrink it down. So it's smaller. It's just like tens of millions of vectors. ANN benchmarks is generally even smaller than that. And frankly speaking, in ANN benchmarks, most of the data sets are very outdated. So uh, there are, let's say, 50, 100, 200 dimensional vectors from some obscure models. They do not really reflect the um, distributions produced by most transformer-like architectures. Uh, and when you run those benchmarks, uh, in some cases, they run in single-threaded mode, which is also not representative of modern setups. So in my case, I often run on machines that have hundreds of cores, and our libraries are used uh, in all kinds of different large AI research labs. Uh, those would generally work with DJX H100 nodes. Every one of them is, uh, like again, over 100 CPU cores. So you need to make sure that those algorithms run in parallel. While those benchmarks generally just focus on the construction speed on one core, search speed on one core, recall, which is the number of uh, search results that were found um, compared to some ground uh, truth uh, subset. And then there is another metric that is not commonly used. It's called uh, NDCG, which is the normalized discounted cumulative gains, which compares uh, two lists or two rankings. So like. In large-scale search, if you were to work at Google or Bing, um, those metrics are very common. Once you start benchmarking those, and you can use like tools that are known in the Linux community like Perf, it will uh, sp uh, spit out uh, a chart uh, or like a table like this in your console, highlighting some of the problems of those algorithms. Assuming it's multi-layer graph that indexes our point cloud, uh, there will be a lot of bottlenecks very common to graph algorithms. So 94% of the CPU cycles are wasted idle waiting for RAM. So essentially like random access memory uh, is designed as this abstraction and like accessing memory is supposed to be cheap compared to like SSD, but compared to CPU caches, it's freaking expensive. So it's a few hundred CPU cycles that you may waste just waiting for memory to be fetched from RAM into the CPU. And then we notice 2.4% branch prediction misses. So this is also uncommon to most high-level programmers in Python, but if statements are actually super expensive. When you write down an if statement, uh, your CPU guesses if this uh, statement is going to evaluate to true or false. And depending on this, it uh, will kind of start speculatively executing one of the branches. It predicts to be uh, the right one. But then if the prediction is wrong, your CPU runs forward ahead uh, of the result. Uh, then it realizes that it's running in the wrong direction and it has to revert and uh, um, kind of uh, reset a lot of the computation that has already happened. So if it's happening in 2% of the cases, it's super expensive. So like you might be asking you know, like, Ash, why are you going down this rabbit hole? Like why? we're talking about like branch based predictions and CPUs. Well, because on the large scale, everything becomes like super important. Um, in most cases, people work with vectors that are very large. And uh, then you produce this graph where the neighbors list are also quite fat. And the representations that are used within the vectors are also quite beefy. So most people would just use the vanilla float numbers. So in Python, when you use a float, it's a 64-bit double precision floating point number. Uh, in C, it's generally like a four-byte floating point number. But you can go down to two bytes and one byte. And all of this suggests a number of optimization points that you can take. So like in most of my late lectures, I would highlight the problems that arise here uh, in most other implementations. Before we go there, I just want us to like see how big the gap can be. So FACE is another library that kind of implements the same algorithm. And uh, it's uh, kind of using the same data structure. But depending on the quality of the implementation, there can easily be a 4x performance difference, even on a scale of 1 million points. 1 million points is very small compared to what we are aiming for. So let me show you a couple of other tricks that 
we've achieved, thanks to which we got to 10x performance difference and subsequently 100x performance difference compared to phase. So uh, when you have a couple of vectors uh, and you search for the nearest neighbors, you can use NP dot or NP inner to compute the dot product between two vectors. Underneath, they will use efficiency libraries like plus, but those libraries are pretty slow compared to what's used within usearch. So there is this library called SimSim that I've designed uh, and published this year, which computes similarity measures between two vectors much faster than most Python libraries and even C libraries can do. So previously this year, I've published this article, Python C assembly, a two and a half thousand times performance improvement for cosine similarity comparisons. So the way you can achieve a two and a half thousand performance improvement over Python going down to assembly is using what is called CMD instructions. So in assembly, CPU supports those weird assembly instructions where you can analyze multiple uh, elements in parallel fashion, but not parallel between CPU cores. On the other hand, parallel this would be like parallel within a single CPU core. So the 0 0.3 nanoseconds that the CPU takes to implement, to run one cycle of computation, you can process two and a half, uh, like multiple times more pieces of data than most C programs. So on modern CPUs, you get multiple tiers of those assembly instructions that are supported. And SimSim implemented uh, not just AVX or BMI or AVX2 extension, but also AVX512 and AVX FP16 that are available on the newest instances on AWS. So if you go to the AWS and you buy instances of the seventh generation, such as the C7G, R7G, uh, be it uh, like Intel or AMD, you always get support for those kinds of instructions. And you are sometimes paying thousands of dollars per instance, but oftentimes you are not using even like 1% of the hardware capabilities that you're paying for, even if you use NumPy. So, to get an understanding of how big the gains can be, uh, I have this uh, blog, which is called Less Slow. Uh, and one of the articles is SciPy distances up to 200 times faster with AVX512 and SVE, where at the bottom, I have all kinds of comparisons for different similarity measures. Even if you run locally on a recent MacBook, uh, like with an M2 Pro chip, the cosine distances compared to SciPy can end up being 23 times faster, 58 times faster, 41 times faster. Uh, then you get Hacker, uh, Hemming similarities, Jacquard similarities, again, 17, 20 times faster. But in some cases, the difference is absurd. So let's say you have two batches of vectors, thousands and thousands in each, and those are int eight vectors compared to SciPy, the cosine distance computation will be 189 times faster. If you can com compare the similarity between two, two vectors this much faster, you can later uh, combine them into a vector search library that builds up the index using those very efficient similarity measures. And in our case, we've also made sure that it's also feature reach. So like it supports exact distance uh, and exact search uh, functionality, obviously, like most other engines. It supports viewing indexes from disk. So you can use a Biffy instance where you uh, compute the index on a large instance, but what, then when you want to serve it, you don't want to pay for this much RAM. So you much rather uh, serve the results from disk. You can do that with usearch as well. And of the other nifty features that are not supported by most uh, vector search engines, uh, usearch supports clustering. So essentially, instead of using TSNE or UMAP or SciPy, to cluster the points uh, ad hoc, you can actually use the index that was already pre-constructed to perform clustering in close to real time, and even on billions of points, which is a very rare functionality. And then uh, one other feature that is interesting, not commonly used, is being able to perform joins between different collections. So let's say you're exploring your data within uh, Voxel 51 or some other toolkit, and you have a collection of uh, image descriptions and images, and you want to intersect those and find uh, the points that are closest to each other. 
uh, in many cases, that was, this would have quadratic complexity where you compare every image against every text to kind of try and link them together. Using approximate matching algorithms within your search, you can perform this much faster as well. And then one of the other nicer feature that is uh, useful for data scientists and representation learning researchers is that you can define arbitrary similarity uh, functions between different objects. So you may be asking like what kind of other distance functions I may want to use. And the answer is like, actually like anything you want. So one of the projects that we released with AWS uh, just a couple of weeks ago was uh, the largest search index in the history of chem informatics, I guess. So I've indexed 7 billion molecules with 28 billion molecular representations, and those produce bit strings. And to compare those bit strings, you need to define a custom measure, a custom similarity distance uh, for it to work efficiently. So through most other vector search engines, I wouldn't be able to accomplish this through use search, I was able to define a custom function with Numba that is later passed down to you search uh, to search for similar molecular structures. And now we're doing the same for longer protein-like structures. So going from chemistry to biology. This is not where we're gonna stop. So aside from being able to search and navigate for billions of points, I wanna be able to also navigate through billions of textual documents. So most uh, existing systems today use BM25, uh, available within Lucene or Elasticsearch or some other libraries. Most of those systems use inverted indexes, which is super inefficient. And I want to adopt the same data structures using the Stringzilla library, which I also designed and published uh, a few years ago, to be able to perform search over texts, even billions of texts, in a very efficient manner. And the midterm goal that will be available with a new search within a couple of months is being able to navigate through hybrid point clouds of texts and vectors and molecules and proteins, uh, defining custom similarity measures that allow you to perform RAG on much broad, in much broader setting than text. We've already uh, got part of this vision done. So uh, within Unum, we actually train our own AI models. Uh, we publish them, we open source them under Apache 2.0 license. They're called Uform. Those are the smallest multimodal transformer models in the industry. So many of you are familiar with Clip or OpenClip that can be used for text to image search. Our, lab, our embeddings are three times smaller in terms of number of dimensions. They're five to 10 times cheaper in terms of inference. Uh, they are multilingual by design. So we've trained on balanced multilingual data set, reaching higher accuracy on almost every language out there, in some cases with outstanding recall improvements. So from 22.7 for Arabic to 31.7 with our neural networks. With this, we were able to go from just pure text search to also text to image search. Combining those with our previous endeavors and protein discovery and molecule search, we'll be able to build RAG system for next generation foundational models that far exceed the capabilities of modern systems. So with this uh, uh, very uh, high level overview of some of the libraries and projects that we build around use search and retrieval augmentation, I think I would, uh, uh, I would end and would be open to questions. Uh, Jim, the question is please describe how we might use your code. Oh, it's super simple. So like for every library that I have, you can just like pip install it from PyPy if that's your preferred, uh, if Python is your preferred programming language. So you can install like pip install use search to use our vector search library. If you work with large textual data sets, you can pip install stringzilla. And in that case, you'll be able to parse textual data sets much, much larger. So, oh, sorry, much, much faster. So let's say instead of using the default Python string class, you may want to, let's say, split a large collection of new line delimited uh, JSON documents or logs or web archive, HTML dumps before passing them to your neural network. For all these kinds of things, you can pip install Stringzilla. If you wanna use SimSim to compute distances between vectors hundreds of times faster, you can just pip install SimSim. And this will bring all of the functionality for all the newest CPUs available on the market into your Python environment. It's about as simple as it gets. And by the way, the packages are also much lighter. So let's say 
phase uh, has a package on PyPy that is over 10 megabytes in size. Uh, our packages are under one megabyte, so it's fairly lightweight. We have a question from Malik. Uh, can we use CMD optimized tricks to speed up the transformer based model inference? Basically, we're doing matrix vector multiplication instead of vector vector multiplication. Uh, well, almost all, if not all, uh, AI inference packages extensively use CMD. And many of them do not even do this directly. So, like some of them use BLAS, which under the hood would use uh, the uh, CMD optimized matrix multiplication uh, libraries or vector matrix multiplication libraries or vector vector multiplication libraries. So uh, there is honestly very little to optimize there. Uh, you can achieve improvements, algorithmic improvements in sparsity. So if you go from dense matrix multiplications to sparse matrix multiplications, both your algorithms becomes better, uh, algorithm becomes better, and there are not that many optimized libraries yet. So you can start optimizing them for CMD. Uh, other than that, um, I think uh, you're just better off using what's available in the market. Um, uh, Shrikat, uh, that was a great in-depth talk. Thank you. So a good implementation would be you form for embedding, you search for search, RAG to LLM. Is there a small scale where you search is not efficient? Um, great question and right understanding. You form for embeddings, you search for search. We also are about to release this model, multi-model generative model in the industry. I don't want to spoil the surprise. Uh, it's coming up soon. So like you can use that for RAG as well. Uh, on a small scale, I wouldn't say there are places where usage is not efficient. It's kind of efficient everywhere, but you can find corner cases where some other libraries on small scale would be faster. So recently, uh, within uh, my company's blog uh, blog, we published uh, this blog post, 10x faster than Metaspace, uh, where we extensively compare the recall, the throughput, construction speed, search speed of phase against our libraries. And as you can see on a scale of like 1 million points, phase seems to be faster. As you go forward, the gap is not even like 10x, it can be like 100x and construction speed and just as big of a gap in search speed, especially after 30 million points. Uh, recall stays consistent between the, uh, the indexing libraries. And as we can see, our performance is also quite stable up to a billion points and beyond. Um, what do you think uh, about perhaps using Apple Neural Engine in the future? Thanks. Uh, thank you, Jim, for the question. Apple Neural Engine seems nice. Yesterday on Hyper News, I saw the MLX project by Apple. Finally, they start open sourcing something. Uh, it's not super relevant for us. Uh, so for IO bound problems, a lot of times CPU is better. So you search is faster on modern CPUs than Raft, which is NVIDIA's library on their state of the art GPUs, uh, or it seems to be the case at least, and it's more energy efficient. So we love GPUs. We work a lot on them. Uh, it, they may not be the most appropriate use case for this. Manish, how can uh, integrate use search with Millless Vector Store as vector search engine? Uh, so if I remember correctly, and I'm not sure on this one, uh, Melvus has multiple backends, and uh, they probably have face and HNSW lab. And if they do, it shouldn't be a big difference in terms of integrating our library there as well. So our library is integrated within Longchain, within Llama Index. Uh, last week, Google published a project where they use you search and they published the related paper. It's used within almost every major AI lab. So like it's a very familiar interface for Python developers. I don't feel like there's gonna be any problem integrating it to any other uh, high level data exploration tool, be it Voxel, be it DeepSat, be it uh, Milvus or any other library.